morning. Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 40. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down to Jerusalem from to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, behold, a man from Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, and was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. And so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and to sit with him. And this place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And he who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to the st some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And then Philip said, If you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And when they had come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotas, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now I want to read Ephesians 4, verse 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. I want to begin this morning just briefly looking at the book of Ephesians 4 verse 4, the text that we just read. The scripture said there's one body, one spirit, just as you're called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith. And then he says there is one baptism. Now that is interesting because as you look through the scriptures, there are many examples of baptism. There are the baptisms that we see that are linked to, for example, Noah's flood. The Bible talks about it in this kind of a way. We look at Nahum and we'll talk about him a little bit more and how that was a baptism where he went and dipped in the Jordan seven times. And the Bible says that all of the people were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So there are a lot of baptisms. There's even the water baptism that we're going to talk a little more about this morning with John the Baptist. But there is really only one baptism. Just like there are only really one God. There's only one spirit. There's only one hope of our calling. There's only one Lord, one faith. And one God and Father of all. So there is one of all of these things, including baptism. And the baptism that Paul is referring to is the baptism in which we are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And He becomes the head. We become a member of the body by the Holy Spirit. And this is the one great baptism that all other baptisms are pointing to. If you go back and you look at baptism as it's used in the Old Testament, there is something that can be gleaned about this one great baptism. The Bible said we are by one Spirit baptized into one body. But I want to specifically look this morning at water baptism or the baptism of repentance. When John the Baptist came, the Jews were thoroughly familiar with the concept of baptism. If you want to understand the subject in the Bible, 
one of the ways you can do that is go back and find the first time that that subject is mentioned in the Bible and then begin adding truth to that from there. I have a friend who often says that Bible words do not have definitions so much as they have histories. Baptism is a word that is never really translated in the Bible. It is transliterated. It comes from often the Greek word baptizo, so they didn't even bother to try to translate it, but they just simply made it into an English word from that Greek word. But you start with the first occurrence of that subject, and then you build revelation into that word moving forward, so that by the time you get to the New Testament, you understand thoroughly what God means when he says baptism. Because understand today, saints, that everybody has an idea of what baptism is. And one aspect of this is water baptism, that is to say, baptism of repentance. You see, the Jews called it immersion, or ritual immersion. And as we'll discover as we study and go through this study this morning, ritual immersion was performed in what is known as a mikvah. If you go to Israel today, they've done a lot of excavations all around. And one of the things that they often find associated with a home is a mikvah. And a mikvah is like a pool of water that has been set up so that it holds roughly about, I want to say, about 400 gallons of water. Living water was to flow into this mikvah, and this was to be used for ceremonial purposes. You don't uh, go and just fill it up with buckets of water. That's not how it works. The water was set up so that it would flow into it, like rainwater, or maybe it would be water from a stream or something like that. But it had to be living water, meaning that it wasn't drawn by hand, but it came down from heaven directly. I mean, it either had to be rain or it had to come into a stream, which was rain. It all had to come down from heaven. But here is the mikvah, and it was used to ceremonially dip the people when they needed it. One of the first things that they needed to do to become a proselyte was to be baptized, that is to say, to be immersed in water to show that they are entering into the Jewish religion. Now you could do this if you were a Gentile. So it was odd when John the Baptist was out in the Jordan baptizing people. Why is he baptizing Jews? You know, they are already part of the covenant. They are already part of what God was doing. And typically they would only do this with a Gentile who was entering the faith. But understand that this is what God intended. God wanted to take the Israelites, the Jews, all the way back to the Jordan. All the way back to the beginning. All the way back to where it started. And that would have obviously been in their mind. You'll remember the story that the children of Israel were down in Egypt. They had been down in there for 400 years. They were in bondage to Pharaoh and to Egypt and the people of Egypt. And saints, listen, this is a picture of the devil being like Pharaoh, a type of Pharaoh, and the world, which is, a type, is Egypt, is a type of it. So when they were down there, it was like they were in bondage. They were in slavery. And it was like a picture of us being enslaved to sin, being under the bondage of the devil. But there came a point when God spoke to Moses and he began to lead the people out of Egypt. Now the promised land was a land that was marked out by God. And this is important to understand because there is a literal application to this and then there is a spiritual application. The literal is this. God marked out the property just like you would mark out a map. And he basically said this. Inside this border, even though God owns the cattle of a thousand hills and all the taters under the hills, God owns everything. But inside this border right here, this is going to be uniquely mine. This is uniquely my property. Inside this property is going to be a little bit of heaven on earth. This is going to be where God rules. This is going to be the place from where you can get to heaven from here. This is where you're going to find the voice of God. This is where you're going to find the culture of God. This is where you're going to find God's ways being carried out. You're going to be finding God's will being done inside this border as it is done in heaven. But how many of you know it had been overrun? 
There was wickedness to the point the Bible said that the land was going to vomit the people out. They were committing abominations that you couldn't believe. And so on and so forth. There were evil idols, there were gods, there were everything there. And God told the children of Israel that when you march over this Jordan, you haven't been this way before, you're going to go in here and I want you to utterly throw down their altars. I want you to tear down all of the semblance of false gods because after all, if I could just interject, this is my property, these are squatters on my land and I'm not going to have any other gods before me in this property. It may be happening in Africa, it may be happening in India, it may be happening in the Americas, but in this piece of land, this is where I am going to rule because I am going to be in charge. So they leave Egypt with this mindset that they're going to enter in and they're going to do this. But they had to cross over the Jordan. Now you'll remember that the whole generation died. They, they weren't able to go in because they were just complainers. Oh, we can't do it. It's not possible. We can't serve the Lord. That's really what it's like saying. You're thinking about going over the Jordan. You're thinking about going in to serve the Lord in the newness of life. But John the Baptist took him back to the Jordan. You'll remember what happened. Children of Israel getting ready to march over. God gave them Joshua instruction. Interestingly, Jesus in Joshua is the same word in Hebrew. Nevertheless, they're standing. They've got the ark of God on their shoulders. They step out into the water. The water begins to dry up. It begins to dry up and the people marched across the Jordan on dry ground. And when they crossed over into this new land, saints, understand that so long as they were obedient to God, 100%, not 99 and 44's 100's, 100% 100 obedient to God, that God said, your enemies will not stand before you. You remember what happened. They got to Jericho. God gave them a word. March around the wall and on seven times, on the seventh day, seven times. Then blow the trumpet, and then the walls are going to come down. And saints, listen, so long as they were obedient, they were always going to have victory, and they would never know defeat. But the challenge that you have is that so oftentimes compromise enters in, and as soon as it does, God's power immediately is impacted. And that's what happened. You'll remember the pieces of gold, the pieces of silver, the Babylonian garment, and things like that. And then you have an individual that is taking it by the name of Achan, puts it in his tent, is trying to hide it, can't hide it. The very next thing, the children of Israel are defeated in battle. So God is taking the Israelites right back to the Jordan with John the Baptist. He is basically saying, we're going to do this all over again. We didn't get this right the first time. As a matter of fact, it went so bad that God eventually had to abandon all together. And then the children of Israel were carried away, not to Egypt, but to Babylon, where they were for 70 years. So God is saying, we're going to do a redo. Come on out into the water. And what did they do? The scripture said that they began confessing their sins. They were confessing their sins. And you think, well, well, they're supposed to be serving the Lord. Perhaps so. But they were confessing their sins. They were rededicating, if you like, their lives to the Lord. You say, well, why were they doing it? The Messiah is coming. We've got to get ready. We've got to make our lives ready for the coming of the Lord. He's getting ready to come straight into you. Watch this language. He's going to come. What did the scripture say? Make his path straight. God was trying to make a path straight into the people because he wasn't going to live in a temple. He was going to live in these temples. Right. Are you with me this morning? I hope I'm not putting anybody to sleep. He's going to come straight into you. So he is getting them to a place of repentance. Anything that is of a false God in their life is being dealt with. And the first God that he takes on is the God of Mammon. You say, well... Back in the Old Testament, it was Baal, Asheroth, and Molech. Well, it's mammon now. And that's the first thing that gets tackled. Because what did he say? They're sitting there asking him, well, what shall we do to repent? He says, if you have two coats, do what? Give one away. He said, if you have extra food, what should you do? Give it away. Share. 
And he told the Roman soldiers, he says, be content with your wages and don't extort money from anyone. Told the publicans, all of them. And all of these things, if you look at it, deals with worldly possession and our attitude towards them. And apparently in those days, and we see it even today, that people are all hung up about their stuff or about their money. Don't touch my things or don't mess with my money. See, this is not a new attitude. 2,000 years this has been an issue where the God of mammon, Jesus called it, is sitting on the throne of people's heart. And what did Jesus say? You cannot serve God and mammon. A lot of people try to do it. Just like the Israelites. They weren't trying to keep their little gods in their pocket, thinking God didn't see it when they crossed over into this land. But God was watching. God was watching what they were doing. They were supposed to throw down all of the altars. They didn't do it. Now we're going back to Israel. They were to throw them down. They didn't do it. When you get to the book of Joshua and you're reading through, the angel of the Lord tells them, he said, I said that I will go up with you and I will be with you. But he said, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? And the scripture said the people lifted up their voice and wept because God said, I'm not going to go with you. But your enemies are going to be a thorn in your side. And they're going to be a snare unto you. Why? Because they refused to tear down the false gods. They refused to deal with the altars. And saints, listen. Every one of us has to come to our own personal Jordan where we have to decide whether we're going to serve God or something else. Amen. Whether we're going to serve God or it's going to be God or it's going to be money. It's going to be God or it's going to be lust. It's going to be God or it's going to be a thousand different things that the world has to compete with God. Because listen, saints, you haven't been this way before. This place where you're going, this place where God wants you to be, this life that God wants you to live, this place where you want to be walking with the Lord, you can't be doing that stuff. Because this is God's land. This is His kingdom. Amen. This is the place where His will is done on earth as in heaven. That's how it's going to be. Not inside the boundary of Israel, but inside the boundary of me. Amen. Inside of here. Inside of His church yes. is going to be how this is. So you see then that John the Baptist had to bring everybody back to the Jordan. We're going to do a redo. We're going to try this again. Now let's go. They start confessing their sins. What'd they say? I don't know. They just kept confessing. They didn't stop confessing. I mean, I wonder what it sounded like. I mean, there was probably people everywhere just confessing their sins. Have you ever been in a service like that? I was in a revival one time where we were trying to see God move by His Spirit. God was moving powerfully. A lot of things were happening. We baptized 30-some people in, at one time. And I remember I said, and I was in charge of the meeting, I said, anybody want to come up? Anything you feel like you need to confess? And people just went up to the microphone and began to confess their sins right there in the service. And all kinds of things began to happen. It was a replay of the, of the Jordan River with the children of Israel in John the Baptist's day. And it was a powerful, powerful move of God that was happening. You say, well, what does it look like today? Well, we sing it all the time, but do we do it? I mean, you'd be surprised how many hymns run parallel with sermons that I preach. How many are with me? Well, well, let's look at one. I have decided to follow Jesus. How many of you know it? What's the next part? No turning back. No turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. If you come to the Lord, to your Jordan, and you're thinking, well, if things don't go quite right, I'll just turn back. You're not getting anywhere with God. No, no, not at all. You're not getting anywhere with God. He doesn't believe you. He doesn't believe you. That's right. He's got to be able to believe that we are sincere about what we're doing. We're not keeping anything in the back. We're not going to be like Achan. Ooh, you know, if things go wrong, you know, I got these gold slivers under here. You know, I got this silver. You know, things could go wrong in, in, in this land here, and I've got to have me a little something. No. Burning all of your bridges behind you. Saints, you've got to have an attitude like this. 
I'm not going back. Take my houses, take my lands, take my dreams, take my plans. Lord, I'm putting my whole life in your hands. That's what I'm willing to do. That's what we have to say. The world behind me. Are you still with us, the hymn? I mean, we, we sing it. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, and we keep it behind, right? We're not turning back. We're not turning back. We are going forward. And saints, listen, God knows our thoughts. He knows our intentions. You cannot fool God. You can fool Brother Robert. I can be snowed pretty easily, but you can't fool God. See, you have to turn in such a way that God believes you and that you believe yourself. What did John say? If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. God knows if we're serious or not. So what ended up happening? We turn to the Lord with all of our heart. We confess our sins and we are baptized in water. This is the picture our own personal Jordan. You say, Brother Robert, why do I get baptized? This is something I just do. No, this is the picture. You see, John the Baptist baptized people unto repentance while they confessed their sins. And this was effectual, watch this, until the time of Jesus. What were they doing? They were becoming disciples of John the Baptist. He's the man of God. He's the person that's going. We're going to become his disciples. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. James and John were two of, of John the Baptist's disciples. So they were being baptized in this regard. But you'll remember what he said. He looks over at Jesus. He said, one is mightier than I that is coming, whose shoe sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire whose fan is in his hand and will thoroughly purge his floor, so on and so forth. So what is happening? He said in another place, I, that being John the Baptist, must decrease, he must increase. And the scripture tells us that the people began following Jesus rather than John the Baptist. So there was a handoff that was taking place. Lord, I got him ready. I got them through the baptism of repentance for those that would receive it. And now I'm handing these people off, as it were, unto you. In John 3, verse 26, the scripture said, They came to John the Baptist and said to him, Rabbi, he who it was with you beyond Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So now we're having a change from them being baptized unto repentance with John the Baptist being the person that is going to be discipling them to Jesus doing the exact same process. Only the people are baptized unto Christ, not John the Baptist. You say, well, why is that important? Well, when you get over in the book of Acts, you remember Paul showed up at Ephesus and he, he says to them, he said, uh, you know, have you all received the Holy Spirit since you believe? They said, well, as much as heard. We haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. And they said, well, what were you baptized? He said, we were baptized into John's baptism. And he, and he began to explain what that was for. And he said, basically, that that has already been fulfilled. You need to be baptized unto Christ. And then they took him out and then they were baptized. How many of you know it's hard, hard to get some folks to get baptized the first time? These people here were willing to do whatever God said. So, well, we've got to be baptized again. Let's do it. That's the Lord's will. Let's do it. And that was the exact same attitude, saints, as this Ethiopian eunuch. He's hearing the gospel for the first time. He's hearing about Jesus. He's hearing about how Jesus has died for their sins. And obviously, at some point in the conversation, Philip probably said, well, you need to be baptized in water. So they're rolling along. He sees water, and he looked over at him. He says to, to him right there, Philip, he says, he says, what does hinder me? Why can't I be baptized right now? How many of you wish people had that attitude? Huh? How many of you wish when they came through that door, they thought, what does hinder me, Brother Robert? I'd be like, well, come on, let's go. We'll go to the bathtub if we have to. We'll find something. Hmm? He seen some water, and he said, what does hinder me? His heart was right with God. When your heart truly gets right with God's saints, you don't need somebody to twist your arm to do the right thing. Yeah. 
You don't need somebody that's like, well, I guess, well, if you're making me, well, you, you, you probably need to go back to the Jordan. You've got to go through again. Because clearly there's something not right. You haven't burned the past behind you. You're moving into a place where God's will is done. Not your will. It's not about what you want to do anymore. It's what God is saying. And if God's saying be baptized in water, that is the first thing in my mind, saints, that tests whether or not we're sincere. A lot of people just walk off at that point. Well, I ain't doing that. Well, that's okay. But in order to have your heart right with God, you say, well, Brother Robert, well, what if there's no water? Well, if there's no water, that's a very different thing than if there is water and you're being rebellious. It's a different thing altogether. You see... They started baptizing them unto Jesus. John the Baptist's ministry was fulfilled, and they began moving forward from there. In Matthew 28, verse 18, very familiar verses. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go you therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. You see that? So the issue is about becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ and then observing everything that he teaches. Not just, quote, becoming a Christian or, quote, joining a church. How many of you know that's a very different thing than becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ? And understand something else, saints. We do not disciple people to ourselves. Amen. We disciple them to Jesus. Right. I don't have any disciples. Amen. Nope. And I'm not trying to get any. No. The Bible says in the book of Acts concerning the people at Ephesus, when Paul was getting ready to leave, he said, grievous wolves are going to come in and lead disciples after themselves. Yeah. That's not God's will. Listen, saints, my objective is to introduce people to Jesus so that that relationship between them becomes exclusive. So that if I fall out of the picture, their relationship continues to flourish. How many of you are with me? It's not about making myself relevant. It's not about making sure I have a place in this deal. No, my only place is to do whatever I can to disciple people to Jesus. And then they walk with him the rest of their life. They don't need me to be their so-called kind of spiritual guide. No, 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 no. I want everybody to hear from the Lord for themselves. Well, it's that or my phone's going to be ringing every five minutes. But Brother Robert, what do you think I would do? Like, well, what's the Lord saying? Have you been praying? What's the Bible saying? See, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to disciple people to Jesus. So that when you baptize them in water, one of the things that you are saying and they are saying is that when they go down in their water, when they come back up out of the water, they are going to have their ear in tune to him. Right. If he says go, you say, Lord, where? And that's their, your attitude teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end. You'll remember the story of the man who was born blind. And they just couldn't understand, you know, how are you healed? The Pharisee's like, how did that happen? And he's like, I already told you. I remember that. And he's like, and then he asked them this question. He said, do you also want to become his disciples? They said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. You see the difference? You see, there were people that were following Moses. They were following the teachings of Moses, but there had to be a handoff, a transition, to where they were now following Jesus. And they did this through being baptized in water, confessing their sins, and then his name being over their life moving forward. Saints, listen, I'm not baptized under John the Baptist. I'm baptized under Jesus Christ. I'm not baptized under D.L. Burge. Even though that was who probably baptized me. I can't remember. 
And I've baptized quite a few people, and they're not baptized unto me. They're baptized unto Jesus, and they are to serve him all of the rest of their life. But saints, listen, if there is one thing that the devil has fought over the last 2,000 years, it has been baptism. This simple thing of baptism, he has fought it over and over again. I've written extensively about, about this. I've taught about it. And there came a point to where, and I talked about this, you heard me recently, about an individual by the name of Novation getting sick. And they're like, well, he's too sick to put him in the water. Because back then they thought, well, we'll just wait till we're dying to be baptized so that we can make sure all our sins are forgiven. I mean, you know, that was a complete misunderstanding of baptism. Yes. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse your sins. You follow the Lord in water baptism because you're signifying that I'm turning from the old life. I'm dead to the old person, just like when you go down the water. It's like I'm going down into a watery grave. I am dead to the old person. That's right. Amen. Yep, that's right. One of these days, saints, I'm going to pass away from this world. That's right. And whether or not I have an open casket funeral or whatever, I can tell you this, that all my life I have enjoyed ice cream. <laughs> well, you walk by my casket on that day, you can wave it under my nose all you want and I'm not going to move. Because right. I'm dead to it. That's right. Amen. I'm dead to this world. That's right. I'm going to be dead to everything about this life. And saints, listen, this is the picture of baptism. You're dead to it. You're dead to who you used to be. You've gone down into a watery grave symbolizing what God is going to do in your life through the Holy Spirit. Raised with Him through baptism, the Scripture talks about. But see, understand that it has caused a lot of controversy after novation. They figure, well, you know, if He was sprinkled, it ought to be good for everyone else. Now, I'm, I'm just going to summarize several several pages of notes for you. I'm not going to wear you out with a lot of details. And how many of you know, any time that there is a compromise of a rule, that becomes the new rule. Yeah. It happens in the workplace. Yeah. If somebody comes into work late every day, that becomes the new rule. That's right. Then everybody comes in late. And that's exactly what happens when you compromise God's Word. So then it became, well, if it was good for novation, it'll be good for us. So people started being sprinkled with water. Well, how can you show a picture of being dead? How can you show a picture of a river with sprinkling some water? And I'm not mocking anyone, because there are people that believe this is effectual. But I just want you to understand, even as late as the second um, Great Awakening in the United States, you had ministers like Charles G. Finney, that they would hold these revival meetings that would be powerful. I mean, people would be under conviction to the point where they would fall out of their seats and they couldn't get up off the floor. But once they got up off the floor, it wasn't, they weren't told things like this, what do you need to do? Well, you need to be baptized in water. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They weren't told these things like that. They were told, you just need to come sit on the front row. Or you need to raise your hand. And when you would ask these ministers, they would say things like this. Well, it answers to baptism. What do you mean it answers to baptism? Nobody has the authority to change God's word. I mean, who has the authority to make these sweeping changes to God's words? You know, well, we don't do water baptism anymore. We say the sinner's prayer. We don't do water baptism anymore. We have people come up front and sit in the front. Or we have them raise their hand. No, no, no. What does the Bible say? Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all through the book of Acts where people are baptized. So what is the first step? Repent of your sins, believe Jesus Christ, put your faith and trust in Him. Turn from all of the sin in such a way that you burn your past behind you. I'm dead to that, that's it. And you symbolize this reality through being baptized in water. Does that save you? Nope. It doesn't save you. 
I heard a preacher say one time, and it, it's a little bit facetious. He said, if you're not saved when you're baptized in water, you just go down, you know, as a, as a sinner and you come back up wet in hypocrisy. And that's what happens. But if our heart is truly right, we want to do what the Lord has asked us to do. And he's told us to follow him in baptism. This is a picture of being baptized into Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit and then coming up and then beginning to walk in the newness of life. In other words, it's like we've come out of the Jordan. We've crossed over the Jordan. We've got, as it were, the, the ark of God over our shoulder, which represents the authority of God and the very throne of God that we begin moving in the power of God. And saints, listen, if we would walk and serve the Lord and we would get rid of all the idols out of our life and stop playing games, our enemies would never stand before us. You say, Brother Robert, why does it seem like in the book of Acts they just lay hands on people, they was healed. They just speak to that demon, it would come right out. There was no argument. It's because when they crossed over the Jordan, they left the past behind them. They don't have idols in their life. They don't have any compromises in their life. They don't have anything in their tent, so to speak. And that makes all the difference, saints, in the world. If we're allowing God to change us, and it could be anything. It doesn't have to be something like a piece of gold or even wealth or anything. It could be anything that we're not allowing God to deal with because God wants to deal with these things in our life. You say, Brother Robert, I was baptized before, but I was backslidden. Should I be baptized again? That's up to you. The Bible does talk about it in the book of Revelation, repenting and do your first works again. When I came back to the Lord, I, did, I was baptized in water again. Now, in ancient times, you go back, I say ancient times, about 500 years ago, they used to baptize children, saints. They would sprinkle them. And they would be confirmed. And the, the idea was very similar to when you would circumcise them on the eighth day. So instead of circumcising the child, they would baptize them in water to bring them into the covenant. That was their thinking. It's not a biblical thinking, but that was their thinking. And then that person was said to be baptized, even though they never repented. I mean, how would you repent at six months years old or, or, or six weeks? Or how would you repent? You couldn't, right? Right. So when they would get old and they would hear the message of repentance, they would say, I need to be baptized in water. And people say, well, you can't because you're already baptized. And it became such a sore spot, listen, saints, that people were put to death in droves over this. That's how serious it was. People said, you know what? I just don't feel right about that infant baptism. I need to be baptized in water. I, I, I got to do the right thing. They said, oh, you do, do you? They would strap a rock or something around your legs and they would drown you over that. That is the type of thing that they would do. That's how serious it was to people. And they became known, the people who were baptized again, as the Anabaptists. You know them as Amish, that's one of them. The Mennonites, they're Anabaptists. The Hutterites, they're Anabaptists. Meaning rebaptizers. They didn't believe what had been doing in the, going on in the Catholic Church, that that was effectual. So they were baptized in water again. And saints, it has been a controversial subject over the years. But to me, it's always been very straightforward. The whole idea of baptism is the idea of immersion. You go down into the water, completely under the water, and you come back up out of the water. When I baptize people, it's the standard old school method that it's always been. I typically ask people, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Yes. Have you turned from all your sins? Yes. You want to be baptized in water? Yes, I do. I said, okay. Do you have anything you'd like to share with the people? And if you're in the baptismal, you best not touch the microphone or you're going to be having a funeral. <laughs> and they may say something like, well, I just want to say, I appreciate the Lord. You know, I appreciate Him saving me. I come out of deep sin. And I'm just grateful to be here tonight. All right? Turn around. Upon your confession and faith, call them by name, the Lord Jesus Christ. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Down into the water they go, under the water they come back up. Sometimes, not often, sometimes people in that instant receive the Holy Ghost. 
And their life in that moment has changed. Other people, I've seen them receive the Holy Spirit later. And it just depends. But that's the pattern. Repent, put your faith and trust in God, be baptized in water, receive the Holy Spirit. Sometimes these things are reversed. It doesn't matter. But this is always the goal. And saints, if you need baptized in water, if you feel like it, but I just want to make it available because I want to follow the Lord in water baptism. I want to be obedient to the Lord. Father, we're just so grateful this morning.